30. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, or take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, of course, you see this little contraption right here. Now, uh, uh, first, first glance, I thought it was one of those old school medieval torture chambers that you stick your head in and you carry around. But with further study, we find that it is used for animals, for oxen. So, uh, go to the next one, Antoine. Thank you, my friend. There it is, right there. That's the yoke. Now, what do you notice about when you look at this thing right here? What's some of the obvious things that you just pick out? Huh? It's on their neck, it's on their head, okay? What's significant about being around the head? Anybody? It controls the direction of where they go. If you notice, anytime an animal needs to be controlled, you control them by the head. Same thing with the horse. You put the bit in the horse's mouth, once you turn that thing, imagine somebody having something in your mouth and pull. Immediately, you're like, what, you want me to go this way? Let's roll. You know, because it hurts. Same thing with dogs. You hook the head, if you want to break them to get them to do something, you hook it around their neck. Every puppy that you get is going to resist following you. As soon as you throw that leash on them, they're going to go, wait, wait, whoa, hold up, hold up. Mm -mm, mm -mm. And you got to drag them. Once they feel that pressure around their neck, they're like, I see where you're trying to get me to go. And so one thing you can realize is that it's around the neck. Not only that, what about the animals? What do you notice? Anything? Say so what? They look kind of sad? Well, we don't know. I've never talked to an ox about that. Hey, ox, if you sad, do this. No, we don't know. What, what else do we know? They're what? What kind of animals? They're oxes. What else? Anything? Notice that they are similar animals. Notice that they are the same size relatively. Go ahead. Next one. But he's at an angle. He's at an angle, okay? See, you always got somebody like, no, one probably is about 10 pounds less. So what is the yoke? The yoke has been used to bind two separate animals of the same species. So they bind the two animals. They're selected for their similarities in size. So when they put the yoke upon the animal, they had to make sure both animals were equal in size. Not only that, both animals had to be of the same breed. They couldn't be two separate animals. All right, They had to have the same temperament. You couldn't yoke two animals together and one of them is aggressive and one is passive. One wants to serve, one doesn't want to serve. So now, they had to make sure these two animals had the same temperament. Not only that, they both had to have the willingness to work. If you're going to do any type of work with anybody, whether it be husband, wife, friend, brother in Christ, person on your job, you got to have the willingness to work. Nothing worse than you doing all the labor and your partner sitting there cooling. That will cause conflict immediately. I work, and it gets upsetting sometimes when I'm working with the kids, and I see somebody else over there on the computer just silking it. And I be wanting to tell them, man, would you get up? But I ain't the boss. If I ever become the boss, heads are going to roll. So the point is the willingness to work. The yoke binds them by the neck, head, or shoulders to harness their combined power. So what happens is you bring two animals together, and it creates even more power than just having one. And they put them around the neck to yoke them together or bring them together to get the best out of the animals. Next. So the yoke is, is not a one size fit all kind of instrument. It has to be properly measured to ensure a proper fit for each animal. So you can't just say, hey look, uh, here's two oxes, just grab that yoke and throw it on. You have to measure those animals and make sure that the yoke fits properly on each animal. All right, the yoke is made to slip comfortably between the neck and the shoulders of each animal. If there are any cracks, splinters, or rough spots on the yoke, so now when you look at the master of these two animals, he has to be a good master. He can't just say, let me put anything around the neck. He has to weigh the animal. He has to make sure that the animal has certain temperaments. And then when he makes this yoke, this yoke has to be smooth. It has to be something that is light enough to where it won't weigh the animal down. It has to be something that is smooth enough to where it won't harm the animal or cut the animal. All right? If there are any crack splinters, I've read that part. If the yoke isn't measured correctly, it can harm the animal. Example, being too small can slowly choke the animal to death. So now, as these little oxes start off as little oxes and start to grow, 
if the master doesn't adjust that yoke, it will slowly choke these animals to death. The best animals are yoked when they're young, trainable, and can be fed and motive, uh, uh, monitored to ensure the equal growth rate. Now, what are we saying here? As you look at this, you always look at the natural. When God talks about yoking two animals together or, you know, anytime he uses a word or an analogy in the Bible, it is done so that he can show us something. He shows us something in the natural so that we can see something in the spiritual. So now you see he's talking about these two animals. We're talking about these two animals being yoked together. In the Old Testament, when he talked about yoking these animals together, they start off being young and they're trainable. All right? And the person who yokes them together have to monitor these two animals. He has to feed these animals the same diet. He has to make sure they're growing at the same rate. If one animal starts outgrowing the other, that's a problem. So now these animals have to be grown and monitored as they grow. Keep in mind that these animals, though young, have previously been their own master and making them a team that will work for another master can be challenging. So understand, you see where we're going with this? Now you're taking it to the spiritual. When the joke upon us and we come to the Lord, we have to understand, I don't care if you are 16 when you give your life to the Lord. You still have a past. 16 years you've been doing things the way you want to do them. I know I was a hell raiser by 16. I mean, I would like to think the average kid would still be innocent by the time they're 16. But if you was anything like me, you was into shenanigans by 16. 16 is too late. If you don't get hold to a kid and introduce them to Christ by about five or eight years old, you are in trouble. I know this because I teach little cats. And I heard some language today in a locker room because they didn't know I was in there. After school, I'm going to get my workout in. I'm changing clothes. Basketball team, seventh graders, in there getting changed. Man, you bleeping, 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 bleep. I said, what? And they heard my voice, and they was, uh-oh. And sure enough, I let that dude have it. But you have to understand, the average person would see a bunch of seventh graders and say, oh, they're young, they're cute, they're innocent. I'm looking back, when I was in seventh, I was devious. Man, I cussed, I cheated, lied, did everything I could. Seventh grade is too late. So now, even if a person gets saved young, they still have to be broken. They still have to be trained. They still have to be nurtured. They can't just say, well, just because I'm 11 or 12 or 15 when I come unto the Lord, I'm going to be obedient. Same thing with the puppy. If you buy a puppy, you would think, oh, it's so little and cute and innocent, it's going to be obedient. No. Even though that puppy is about six to eight weeks old, you still have to break it being free and wild. That puppy didn't have a leash. It went wherever it wanted to go, use the bathroom, wherever it wanted to use the bathroom. And now you're telling it, no, go outside and use it. You have to untrain bad behaviors, and a good master knows how to do that. So now you have these animals that have been raised since they was little, but even though they started off little with that yoke, they still had to be broken and trained. Behaving this way is contrary to nature. So now you see nature to pair up with another ox side by side and work together on one accord. They're used to going their separate ways, doing whatever they want. They're not used to a master putting something on their shoulders and saying, you're going to go where I tell you to go. It is totally contrary to their nature, just like it's contrary to our nature for the Lord to put his yoke upon us and start saying, nope, go this way. I want you to turn this way. Back up. We like, ah, man, uh-uh. For 22 years I've been going this way, now you're telling me to go this way. And so now you see how God has to put that yoke on us and begin to break us to the point where we say, if the master say go right, it's for our own good. It's not just for him to get some amusement out of it, but it's for the good of ourselves and everybody else. And so <clears throat> it goes contrary to these young animals' nature to have the yoke upon them. These animals have already learned many things before they begin this training. It is the team master's job to undo some of the things that they have learned and to teach many new things. Now, you can apply this to your relationship with the Lord depending on where you are. So you've been living X amount of years. You decide, I'm going to give my life to Christ. You get saved, and at first you're willing to do anything. You come in excited, but then you realize you still have things in you that want to do what you want to do. And you want to go your own direction. You want to say what you want to say. You want to live how you want to live. And the Lord has to now break you and undo all the stuff that you have learned up until that point. God bless you if you were fortunate enough to be saved at a very young age and God started dealing with you then. And you didn't acquire a lot of garbage. But I recommend that a person get saved as young as they can. 
Because by the time you're 22 or 23, you have developed so many scars. You have developed so many habits, so many behaviors, so many isms and schisms. You've seen so much stuff that now, even though you say you have to fight to make sure that that stuff don't creep back up in your same walk. And every time it pops up, the Lord has to say, let me pull on the reins and make you go opposite direction when everything in you wants to go ahead and indulge yourself in your past. And so now, you see how the master has to begin to train them. He has to begin to mold them, flip it. <clears throat> the yoke, every time they are in the yoke, they will learn something either beneficial or unbeneficial. So now you have these animals. Soon as the Lord puts the yoke on us, or when the master would put the yoke on the animal, he had to teach them something that would either benefit them or not benefit them. Now, what am I saying by that? That means that sometimes he would say, look, if you go this way, it will be easy for you. And I don't have to control and pull as hard or choke you a little bit and let you know. Now, all of a sudden, you learn, man, if I just cooperate with the master, things are easy. But then you learn the hard way. Some of us are stiff-necked. Some of I'm going to keep it real with y'all. I'm a knucklehead. The Lord has had to beat me many times to show me you can't do what you want to do. Now, when I say, yes, Lord, it's easy. I'm like, man, you taught me something, and that went real smooth. If I start doing what you ask me to do, life will be simple. But yet, when I say, nah, man, I'm going to do what I want to do, now he says, I'm going to teach you a lesson, but you're not going to like this one. This one, I got to yank on you, I got to pull you, you're going to go through the mud, you're going to go through the muck and the mire, and you're going to feel it. You're going to learn from it, but you're going to feel it. And so would you rather learn a lesson that feels good or a lesson that you go, I learned it, but man, that would hurt. And so humans have to get to the point, Christians have to get to the point when you say, I'm going to take the Lord's yoke upon me. I want to learn lessons that are easy, not the ones that's going to hurt me. And so now, even as these little animals, the master that's control. he said, look, if you just do what I want you to do, it will go smooth. Soon as they start going separate ways, he has to break them. He has to hurt them. He has to punish them and discipline them so they realize, if I just listen to the master, things will go smoothly. I know this because I raised dogs. I had to break every puppy. One puppy refused. His name was Blue. He was the most disobedient dog I've ever had. And I had to walk this cat, and out of all the dogs, they learned real quick. Because I'm just, man, my wife, she talks about me. She's just, just a barbarian. You're just so rough. Because I drag a dog halfway down the street, you know? <laughs> drag him. People like, what are you doing? <laughs> my dog. You drag a dog. <laughs> Ain't even walking him. So I did that to Blue. Blue didn't care, man. Blue was like, you. one time I thought I was going to kill Blue because he just.